Okay, so we're gonna um talk about Abraham. We're gonna talk about um going over Hebrews chapter eleven, and we're gonna start in Abraham. We're gonna put a pause on the book of Revelation. I really do appreciate feedback. Um, uh, so I want to put a pause on the book of Revelation, and then I will go back there after this uh, short series. Abraham and the call, Abraham and the call. So in this lesson, we will study the life of Abraham and we'll focus on the trust that he had in God when he left his homeland to go into a place he was not familiar with. We will make the connection between Abraham's call and our, our call out of Babylon and the call of God's people to be separated in order to receive their inheritance. We need to remember that we are just pilgrims in this world. There is something that has been promised to us, right? There's a place that has been promised to us. There's an everlasting life that has been promised to the obedient children of God. So we're going to see the comparison between that and Abraham's life and his call. So the first question says, what did God ask Abraham to do by faith? And we know that. Uh, when we read Hebrews 11, 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. So we know that he was called out from a place for an inheritance. God says, come out from here, and I'm going to give you an inheritance. Abraham believed God and was willing to do something that perhaps was challenging for him to explain. He did it by faith, and in the process, he had to leave family, members, and associates behind. So how many of us can say that if God calls us today to live where we are right now, to a place that He doesn't, we don't even know, how many of us are willing to do that? Well, something to think about. When God commanded Abraham to leave his country, did he know where he was going? We know that he didn't know. He was just believing in God, right? He was just being obedient to what God um, was calling him to do. So we know in um, Genesis 12, 1, he says, Now the Lord has said to unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, Unto a land that I will show thee. So that was all he got. A land to a land that I will show thee. He doesn't know where, he doesn't know anything. But he was obedient and went. Since Abraham didn't know where he was going, what what was he holding on to as evidence that God will perform his word? Genesis 12, 2 to 3, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So that was the promise God gave to him when he said, leave. So what was he holding on to? He was holding on to the promises of God. So my question back to you guys is, what give God gives you this promise today, today? And says, leave where you are. I'm going to do this for you. How many of us are willing to do that? Anyone wants to share? Anyone will be willing to do that? Without thinking, oh, you know, now we have a lot of things going on. My, fa my family, you know, my children, my job. Oh, I have bills to pay. How many of you do you think can do that? Okay. Let's see. While we are waiting for God for answers to our prayers, what must be what must we cling to by faith as Abraham did? We know that we need to cling to the promise of God. That's why we really need to read the Bible so that we can know the promises that is in there for us. Abraham was just holding on to this promise that get out, I'll make you, you know, great. 
I'll curse those who curse you, I'll bless you. That's all he had. And he was just holding on to that. Philippians 4, 4 19 says, but, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. First Timothy 5, 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who will do it. God is faithful. He calls us. Whatever he says, we need to understand that he will do it. If he promised that he will bless, he will bless. Isaiah 33, 16. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be omniscience of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. This is an assurance to God, to, uh, of God to us that uh, we will never lack bread nor water. As long as we put him, the rock, you know, we are in the rock. Our bread and water shall be sure. So that we need to be holding on to the promise of God. What was Abraham's original name when God called him out of the land of, uh, um, out of his fathers? And we know that his name was Abram. Abram means what? Abram means exalted father. And this is very important to know that when we talk about name, we are talking about character. And I think we did discuss this before. In the Bible, when we, uh, you know, we uh, what does a name represent? We know that a name represents character. That's why, you know, many Africans, you know, we are specific about naming, how we name our children, how we name our children, because we know that names are very, very um, important. Because whatever you are calling the child, if you go, you have a child and you name them Lucifer. You know, I've heard that name. I'm like, what? Why would someone name, you know? Lucifer, we know that it's a, a light bearer. But what does the implication of that means, you know? So we need to be particular um, about the name we choose for our children. Now, these days, people just name because it sounds good. But a name is a character. As the name that you're calling your child will build that character for you. So when we look at Exodus, um, this is when um, Moses was saying, was asking the Lord to show him his glory. And what did the Lord show him? His goodness, right? His character. God was showing him his character. He said, I will let all my goodness pass before thee. And he was saying, I'm, uh, the Lord, merciful, gracious, long-suffering. These are all the characteristics of God. A name represents character. Names are important and are, are of special interest to God. For example, God called Abram out of the land of his fathers while his name was still Abram. It was important that God change his name to reflect a character more like his own and as an evidence of Abraham that God will fulfill his covenant to make him the father of many nations. Naming is very important. So what was the condition Abraham had to meet in order to receive God's promise? There was a condition to it. Hebrews eleven eight says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should, he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. It's attached to obedience. God's promises to us is also attached to obedience. Remember that we also have an inheritance. God has promises also inheritance. But the condition of that inheritance is what? Obedience. It's obedience. And we've been talking about this a lot on this platform. Obedience to God. So that we can inherit that everlasting life. So that we can inherit that heaven and the new earth that he has promised to us. Just as Abraham. He had to live it all. He was obedient. He didn't even know where he was going, but he was obedient to God. So what was the relationship between God and Abraham? James 2.23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. We know that Abraham was called a friend of God. Isaiah 41, it says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. 
Second Chronicles 27, art, thou, um, art not thou our God, who did it drive out the inhabitants of the land before thy people Israel, and give it to the seed of Abraham, my friend, forever? So God, um, Abraham was God's friend. So my question is, can God call us friend? Why did God call Abraham friend? Because he was obedient. He was willing to give it all just to follow Jesus Christ. He was called friend. And as I always say, when we read Matthew 7, 7, a time is coming, right? When God will tell some people that depart from me, I do not know you. But all along, we think we know God. But the question is, does God know you? We can go to church all we want. We can live all we know. We would identify as Christian. But the thing is that that's God knowing. That's the most important thing. This is Abraham here. God calling him friend. So are we called to be, are we called to be friends with of God? And we know that it is yes. So how can we tell if we are friends of God? How can we tell? John 15, 14 says, Ye are my friends. If ye do what, whatever I command you to do. That's why Abraham was God's friend, because he did whatever God wants him to do. So are we doing whatever God wants us to do? Or are we just having the title of Christianity or being Christian and just living our life anyhow? When we look at the call of God to Abraham, we do not see any hesitation by Abraham to obey the call. Like Abraham, we are to wait for and listen to every word of direction from God. Uh, as it is written in Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That is how we need to live our life. Not by just the food that we eat, uh, by every word that we take God at his word. Many of us want to inherit heaven, the new earth, but want to live in disobedience to God. And it doesn't work that way. It cannot work that way. If we say we are looking forward to this internal life, to inherit the new earth, there is a, 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 a thing attached to it. There's an order attached to it. We have to be obedient. Heaven and the new earth is promised to obedient children of God. So as we are looking forward to that, we need to be obedient to God. So how old was Abraham when God called him out of his father's house? What encouragement can be given to those who are matured in years and desire to serve the Lord? He was. We know that he was 75 years old. We can read that in Genesis 12, 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken unto him. And Lot with him, with him, and Abraham was 70, 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So we know that he was seventy five, but he was still obedient. He was still, you know, following after God's heart. Our age should not limit us from doing the work of God. When we read Psalm 92, 13 and 14, it says, those that, are plant, those that he be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our Lord. They shall still bring forth fruits in what? Old age. Because we are old doesn't mean that we are life should be stagnant. We need to continue this work until, you know, we are unable, until we die. You know, I've seen people that are even crippled that are on the in their wheelchair and they still go out and do evangelism. They still go out and do stuff. Our age should not determine whether we need to continue our work. We need to continue bearing fruit. He was he was 75 years old and he was still walking that walk and bearing fruits for the Lord. So what distinguished Abraham from the other men in the eyes of God? Genesis 18, 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. 
So we know that God know him that Abraham will lead his children in the way of the Lord. All of us on this platform have children. How are we leading our children in the Lord? He commanded his children in order for Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. He had to be a blessing in his household first. Many of us, are, the life that we live in our home is different from the life that we live at, in church. In front of our pastors, we are different. Remember, the unit starts with an individual. It starts with you and your God first. Then it should reflect with you and your family. Then it moves from you and your family to the church. And then from the church, it leads to the community that you are in. Then from the community, it leaves, it, it flows to the other people, to other nations. That's all. That's how it should be from ourselves, with our communion with God daily. Then it reflects in our family, then to our church, to our community, to the whole world. So we cannot be living anyhow at home. Then we are going to church and pretending to be someone else. It doesn't work that way. And I know people do that, you know, but it shouldn't be us. That shouldn't be us. The life we live, the light that we live at home should reflect in the church. We shouldn't be hypocrites. To better accomplish this, God called Abraham away from the influences of his kindred and friends, which would keep him from following God. Sometimes God will have to call us out from our own family members, you know, to be able to achieve what he wants to achieve in us. Many of us, God is calling us from where we are right now, but we are receive, we're refusing to leave because we are so comfortable. We are so comfortable where we are, we don't want to leave. We need to pray. We need to be obedient. Let's, you know, we need to, to just be obedient to God. Who also decided to leave Haran and continue the journey to Canaan because of Abraham's influence. We know that when we read Genesis 12, 5, uh, we know that Abraham took what? Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's uh, son, and all the substance that they had gathered and what the souls that had gotten he had gotten in Haram, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So when Abraham was living in uh, Haran, he wasn't just living by himself. He says souls were going with him also, souls that he has won in that country, so winning. How many of us have, uh, 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 are striving to bring people to, to Christ? We need to think about that. Because that is part of our work as a Christian. As Christians, we need to tell people. We need to uh, bring people to the Lord. We don't, really, you know, we have to, our job is to spread the word. And it is God that brings in the harvest. This is Abraham here. It's not just about his family. He was able to win souls in Haram where he was. And he brought that souls with him to Canaan. Where is our Canaan? That is heaven and the new earth. That is our Canaan. Whose souls are we bringing with us? After God called Abraham out, what did Abraham build to the Lord in Canaan? We know that he built altar. He built altar. And we can read that account in Genesis 12, 6 to 8. And Abraham and Abram passed through the land into the place of Seshem, into the plain of Morah and the Canaanites, and then in the land. And the Lord prepared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And this, and there built uh, he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So he built an altar there. And why do we, why do they build, you know, in the old days, they build an altar a lot, right? It's for worship. So, as Abraham built the altar, what did he lead those around him to do? Altars are meant for worship. Second Chronicles 32, 11 to 12. Does, does not Hezekiah pursued you to give our, 
uh, over yourself to die by famine and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Israel, um, Jerusalem, saying, He shall worship before the one before one altar and bent incense upon it. Altars, when they are built, is for worship. We also have to have altars, you know, where we go and worship in our home, right? Isaiah 36, 7, But if thou say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah had taken away and said, on, uh, said to Judah and to Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar. So Abraham building altars, even his children, and in the latter days, building altars is just a representative of a worship, you know, where they worship. People see it and they ask questions. Why are you doing this? And it's part of ministry. As um, Abraham was erecting um, altars in, in, uh, in Canaan, not only was it witnesses to those in the household, but it also served as a witness to the adulterous Canaanites to worship the true living God. Altars, our life should also reflect because what we do on our altars when we are home will reflect when we go out. That people will see us and see Christ in us. So where was Abraham when God called him first? Where was he? Remember that they were in Babylon when we read um, Genesis eleven thirty one. And Terah, Terah was Abraham's father, took Abraham, his, his son, and Lot, the son of Haram, and his, uh, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son, Abraham's wife. And they went forth um, with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. So when he got the call first call, they were in Babylon, in Chaldean, the Ur of Chaldean was in Babylon, and this is what's with the father, right? So they had that call when Abraham, so with his father and all these people, they were coming out to that promised land of Canaan, okay? And they went into Haran. So when they got to Haran, that's when God called him again to come out of Haran to that promised land. But wherever they were at first, you know, God you know, we're calling them from Babylon and dwelt there. And um, he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the, out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give thee this land to inherit it. So the first call was when they were in um, Ur of the Chaldeans. So let us see, according to the scripture, what is, what is heir of the child and also known as we know that that was Babylon, Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13, um, 19 and 43 and 14. And Babylon, the king of the glory of, of, of kingdoms, the beauty of the world, Chaldean's excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have, sent to, I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. So we know that heir of Chaldeans is just Babylon. He's talking about Babylon. So they were living in Babylon with their father and all the family were living in, Bab uh, in Babylon. Where is God calling his people out of today? Where well, is God calling us out of today as, as he did for Abraham? We know if we read Revelation 18, 2, and um, it says what? And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has, come, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that he might not partake of, this, of her sins, that he received not of her legs. We know that God is calling each and every one of us, including me, 
out of Babylon. This is how God described this present day Babylon. The uh, what? They have all this unclean spirit teaching doctrines that I know in the Bible. God is calling out of this false system of worship, which is Babylon. The same way he was calling Abraham out of that place. After Abraham was called out of um, Chaldeans, the body, that is Babylon, was there a second call? And we know that God called him out of what? Haran. And, and when we read at 7, 3, 4, and said unto him, get out of, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charan. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into the land where he, he now dwelt. So remember the, the journey started with him and the father and everyone. Then he got another call to leave that place to now Canaan. So Genesis 12, 1 is that account of when they were live, the they, the call came for them to leave um, Haran. So in this, so there's two calls that he had. We have to make an application for that in our present day. In this last days, where is God calling his people out from? And how many times did the call, um, if we read Revelation 18, we know that God, the angel was calling twice. There was a two times call, just as Abraham had two calls. Revelation 18 says what? And 14, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is falling, is falling. And it's become the habitation of devils and the, and the hold of every word, foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that he may not be partakers of her sins, that he receive not of her place. If we do not heed this call to come out of Babylon, we are going to receive the plagues of God. There's no two ways about it. We need to heed the call of the Lord to leave Babylon. And there followed another angel. And this is the second call. The first call, Babylon is falling. We need to come out of her. The second call, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is what? Falling is falling. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. God is calling us out. Just as he's calling, he called out Abraham from Babylon. So primarily, who is the Babylon? What does Babylon represent? And we talked about this before. The present day Babylon is the papacy and the apostate Protestant churches teaching false doctrines, letting people drink of the wine of false doctrine. This is what the Bible is saying here in Revelation 18 and Revelation 14. God has his people in these churches and he wants us to call them out. He wants us to be calling them out of these churches. And those are the scriptures. We've gone over this and I don't want us to spend any more time in this. So to understand the call of God's people out of Babylon in these last days, let us look at the ancient Babylon. Ancient Babylon, there was some things that they did also that we can learn from so that we can know specifically what were the false things that they were teaching the people. It goes back to Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. What were they trying to do in them? And then and the next to each scripture, write down the things that Babylon, which God is calling his true, uh, people uh, out of today. So let us go. I said it's Daniel. And I think we did this exercise before when we were in the book of Daniel. Where were they trying to transform the children, those children to? They were trying to uh, um, educate them in their full system of education. Daniel 1, 3, 4. And the king spake unto Ashpanes, the, the master of the eunuch, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seeds and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, 
but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and under and understanding signs and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. So they wanted these children, you know, they wanted to change their education. They wanted to change, uh, teach them about things of Babylon, false system of education. You know, I'm going to say this in a very loving way. Please do not hate me for it, but I have to say it. Many of us, you know, we take our children to schools and the school educate them. When we really study the Bible, education has to start at home first. The mother has a role to play in educating the children. And that was the model, how we we're supposed to live, you know. Fathers go to work, mothers stay at home to educate their children first. I have heard many, many stories about children, you know, that go back, they go to the university and then they come back that they are atheists because that's what they teach them in the, these universities. We need to be prayerfully before we send our children, you know, even Martin Luther was saying that, do not send your children to these universities where God is not the foundation when the scriptures is not the foundation of the, the school, we shouldn't send, we don't have any business sending our children there. And this is what the Babylonians were trying to, you know, teach these children. But we talked about this, because these children were well-trained, they knew their God. But what is happening in our world today? The mother is working, the father is working, and they depend on the school system to train their children. And they, oh, they are so good at it. They will train your children for you very well. But it will not be what you wanted. We need to prayerfully, prayerfully. Before sending our children to anywhere, we need to prayerfully send it. Money, I always tell, say, money is not the answer to all this thing for our children are bringing. If one parent has to stay home, to bring up the children, they need to do it. Money is not all of it. We are going to give an account of these children God has given us. They also try to, what? Daniel 1, 5. And the king appointed them a daily provision. They want to change the, how they eat also. Give them the meat and the wine of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Someone have mm -hmm. a question? Someone have a question? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, okay. Okay. So they were trying to change their food also. Health reform. Remember that we are the temple of our body is the temple of the Lord. We cannot be putting anything in our body. We own our body too. Not just in, but also on our body. We need to learn health reform. Healthy way of eating healthy way of putting things, you know. Please do not trust all these things that they are putting out there. All these makeups and all this, they, they are filled with poison. And then we use them and put it on our body, the way we dress. Please, these are part of the Babylonian teaching that God is calling us from. False system of education, false system of health, they wanted to change their character. How do we know? Because they were changing their name. Remember we talked about character being the name, you know, that's why God had to change Abraham to Abraham. They wanted to change their, they changed their name. So because they wanted to change their character, they wanted to change them to be like the Babylonians. God is calling us out of this false system. Also music, what happened? Remember when the stat, um, the 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 gold, the statue of gold was made. They brought in all these musicians to play music. Does something to us. I'm telling you, go do research on music. What is our churches filled in right now? All these drums and pianos and all these things. And when we go to church, we are so filled, and we say we have goosebumps, and the Holy Spirit was there. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit was not there. 
music reform. We have to have this music. God is calling us out, out of this kind of worship. Most of this worship that is coming out of all those places called the hill song and the elevation and all those, they are not Christian song. I would say that plainly. They are not inspired by God. It is all inspired by the devil. We need to keep things simple. Let us go back to the old ways of doing things. Simple. Just have your piano and some guitar and just praise the Lord with that. Go research into how the drums, all those drums, how it all came out of. Those drums were used to arouse the, the, the evil spirit. You guys, go, look, go do your own research on these things. God is calling out us from those Babylon. These are all part of the Babylonians thing. God is calling us also dress. How are we dressing? Hmm? It's so sad to see, you know, minister's wife coming in with a tight thing and all their stuff is showing up. God have mercy. Please. God is calling us off from all these things. Let people see us, the way we carry ourselves, the way we dress. Let it tell something about us, please. These are all part of the things that came out of Babylon that God is calling us from. So what did God promise to give Abraham? He promised an inheritance, Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive what for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. He was promised an inheritance. And we can read in um, Genesis 15, 6 to 7. And he believed uh, and he believed in the land, in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord. Righteousness is right doing. What did he do? He did the right thing. Okay, don't let me go there. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of heir of the Chaldeans to give thee this land to inherit it. So he was promised an inheritance. Did Abraham literally receive his inheritance or possession of the land of uh, Canaan while he dwelt there? We know that no, he did not. Thousands of years later, that is when his children's children's children, you know, inherited that land. So he did not. What lesson can we learn from that? We also have an inheritance, right, that has been promised to us of heaven. Many of us will die. Many of us will be alive when this will happen. But we shouldn't lose focus of that inheritance. Abraham never lose focus of that. Hebrews eleven thirteen said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. My dear brothers and sisters, all these things we see here, this flashy flash, we think it's flashy flashy thing. It's very soon going to melt away because we are all strangers here. We are all pilgrims here. But there is an inheritance. The Bible says incorruptible. We ca that cannot perish. All these things here, just a breath of God can destroy all these things. But a place has been promised to us that is not corrupt. That cannot die. That cannot. Co there is no corruption there. So why don't we, like Abraham, look forward to that inheritance that will never perish? He did not receive it, and but he had hope. He had the belief. He did the right thing. He obeyed. Although Abraham died without literally receiving possession of his inheritance, Canaan, he died in what? Faith. This means that he was not discouraged. Many times we pray about certain things and we get discouraged and not. One thing we always have to pray about, you know, is the souls of our children, the souls of people, that they should make it to heaven on the new earth. That is our, should be our main focus of prayer. Many of us, our children are astray, you know, and we pray for them. We And the prayer we pray for them are selfish prayer. 
Lord, you know, be with them, bless their work, bless their, bless their work, what? Instead of praying for their soul. Please, if we have wayward children, we need to be praying for their soul. And so praying for them to prosper in their wickedness. God does not answer those kind of prayers. Pray for their soul, that they come back home before it is too late for them. Those are some of the, I heard a story this uh, the other day about a lady, very old lady who finally died. I've been praying for the child, for his son, who was into drugs and all that. Prayed, prayed, prayed. And prayed for the soul of the son. And the, the woman finally died without seeing, you know. The son was still in what he was doing. And the woman finally died. And that at the burial, at the memorial, the son came to church. And this is the pastor that was preaching. He's the one giving the testimony. That son gave his life to Jesus on that day that the mother, the, on the day of the funeral. And I'm like, you know, and he was saying how when this woman wake up in the first resurrection and see the son, will be like, oh, so my prayer work. Never cease praying for your, the, the soul of your children. So where was I going with it? I don't know. But anyway, Genesis 15, 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, walking in obedience. So besides Canaan, what did God reveal that Abraham would receive as an inheritance? So beside the Canaan, it wasn't just Canaan that God promised him. To whom else is this inheritance promised? So when we read Romans 4, 4, um, 4, 13, he said, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world. So God promised him the world also was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness by faith. And when we are talking about the world, we are not talking the, about this world that we are, you know, that inheritance of the new earth that God is going, has promised us. Hair of the world, which is also promised to us. Galatians 3, 29. And if he be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and hairs according to the promise. Are you a hair of Abraham? Are you... Abraham's seed. We know that we are spiritually, we are Abraham's seed. So whatever God has promised him, that the world, heir of the world, that to inherit the world, he has promised that to us. But we have to do what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? He was obedient to death. How can we know that the promise of God are true? Of course we know. If you're a Christian and still do not believe the promises of God, you need to go on your knees. Titus 1, 2. In hope of internal life, which God, that can not lie, promised before the world began. We know that God cannot lie. Whatever he has promised, he's going to do it. We might not be here to see it, but it's going to happen. Abraham did not receive what he, uh, he was promised, but he He's going to receive it. At, uh, he's going to see it, that his children received it, right? And not just this earth, you know. He's not talking about this earth, the world that is to come. In Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So, what is the character that is needed to receive the earth made new, which is promised inheritance? There is a qualification, you know, for you to move from one grade to another, for you to move from high school to college, you have to write an, a, you know, uh, SAT, easy SAT, qualification, you know, for you to pass a class, to move on to another class, you have to write an exam. That's how it is. For us to inherit the promised land, there's a qualification. The Bible says in Psalms 37, 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. And it's not talking about this earth. It's talking about the new earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So the qualification is that we need to be meek, right? 
obedient. And how do we become meek? You know, through obedience. To be meek, what does it mean? Someone who is patient, restrained, a calm temper of mind. These are all qualifications of a true believer, of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So our, we have to be meek to be able to inherit this place. So how do we learn about Jesus and what will be the result? Genesis, uh, John 1, 1 and 14. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Second Corinthians, I don't think I added the 14. Um, Second Corinthians 3, 18 says, but we all with open face beholding us in the glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of God. So how do we learn? How do we learn to become meek? How do we learn to become more like Jesus Christ? By studying his word. I'm not tired of saying this every time. Spend time with the Lord because as we behold his word, we become transformed. We become more like him. How much time do you spend with the Lord? Just you and the Lord. Studying his word. We become transformed. Who will God spend uh, send to prepare us to receive the promise of His inheritance? We know that it's the Holy Spirit. When you read Ephesians uh, 1, 12 to 14, that we should be to the praise of His glory, who is first trusted in Christ, in whom He also trusted. After that, He heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that, He believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is the one that seals us. Remember, at the end, you either have the seal of God or you have the mark of the beast. The Holy Spirit seals us because he's the one living in us to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of love, of joy, of peace, of long-suffering, of faith, gentleness, goodness, meekness, and temperance. Bearing those fruits, that's what make us, uh, you know, sealed in him, which is the earnest of his inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the, uh, the praise of his glory. So as we are studying the word of God and we are beholding him, we are being filled with the Holy Spirit and he is the one doing the work in us and he is the one that is going to seal us. John 14, 16 to 17. And I will pray the Father. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but he know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So, is the Holy Spirit in you? Is the Holy Spirit in me? Are we being the fruit of the Spirit? Are we being like our father, Abraham? So we're going to end it here for today.